Okay, welcome back to the Investigative Journal on this December 11th, 2015 day on our calendar. I'm your host, Greg Anthony, and you're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. You can catch my show every evening from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. That's on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and Pacific Time. Okay, this week I started a group of shows entitled The Origins of the Vatican-Led New World Order, a.k.a. Old World Order. And uh, I got the idea from several emails I received uh, who were asking me to uh, pinpoint the origins. Where did the New World or Old World Order begin? Uh, At what time in history? And so I began to do that on Monday. uh, And it's now Friday, and we're getting to the conclusion of it by working our way backwards in time. And I started by evaluating uh, some of the more, two of the more, influential Vatican-led New World Order proponents, that being Eric Phelps of Vatican Assassins and Tupper Saucy of Rulers of Evil. Those are their books. And I wanted to start there because that's where a lot of people are getting their historical information regarding what's going on in our world today, both in a spiritual and a secular manner. Uh, so we dealt with that, their differences, uh, some of the uh, conversations those two had together. And then we moved uh, from 2015 all the way back now to the story of Cain and Abel to find out maybe where it all began. And uh, it's funny, but throughout the course of history, once you start understanding this stuff the best you can, very complex uh, system, you see similarities that are taking place today that took place back during the time of Nimrod, back, uh, well, even before, you know, if we look in the 1800s, 1700s, 1600s, 1500s, then go back to Nimrod and, and even to Cain and Abel, somehow there are similarities in the way people were governed and the connections between the spiritual and the secular. And today, it is actually no different. And could it be that there's a lineage, there is a line from the time of Cain and Abel to present day that binds all of those people in ruling uh, as the ruling elite under one system that isn't godlike as we know it, uh, that happens to use God and Jesus and the Bible and other religions as a front for what they're doing. Endgame, one world, one government, one religion. And they're selling it on the uh, fact that it's going to be good, good for you. We're going to protect you. And that's exactly what Cain did. And the protection he got was from God. And the question I asked yesterday was, why did God protect Cain after he killed his brother and allow him to create the city of Enoch. And in the Bible, you will see that this protection even gets, like he said, we're going to, God would protect Cain sevenfold, but his, his uh, lineage was protected even more as we finished yesterday. And we're referring to uh, Tupper Saucy's book, Ruler of Evils, because the reason I'm using it is because he gives a real in-depth look at this, uh, more in-depth than I've seen. And I first heard about the story, the, the way Saucy's interpreting in Cain and Abel, when I was in Rome in the 80s and talked to a rabbi who uh, basically said the same thing, almost, not quite as in-depth. But at that point in my life, I was an atheist, so I thought it was all mythology, but I was quite interested. And what spurred my interest was uh, my... Uh, curiosity over the Vatican and what how our government worked together as far as oh boy even back then and yesterday on my show I told you about the terrorism that was going on there and how I was almost killed in a bombing of the American newspaper and that opened my eyes literally to orchestrated terrorism and you know it's very simple they're doing it today 
So really, folks, you know, I, I really want to tell you this. I, I'm so tired of people who think that 1980 is way, way back in history. It's not that. It's a, it's a, a flick of your finger. It's a, it's an, <laughs> just like yesterday when you consider that now we're talking about the origins of the New World Order dating all the way back to the story of Cain and Abel. And we started that yesterday. So let's finish it up today. And then at the end, I have a few comments regarding, uh, I wanted to give the uh, state of the state of how people, uh, there's so many people that are waking up to what's going on today, but is that, uh, is there uh, solutions? Are there solutions uh, equal to the information they know? And what I mean by that is, I read, the, the way to get a barometer on all this is uh, just Google how to live with the New World Order. And you'll see what people say. And it's amaz some of it's amazingly uh, good. And then there's other things that just show me that people really need to do a little bit more homework and research. Uh, so let's get back to this. We left off yesterday when... Uh, for generations after Cain's birth, we find Enoch's great-grandson, and that Enoch being Cain's son, uh, Lamech, still exercising, in fact, augmenting the prerogative of divine vengeance. Lamech said to his wives, and I'm repeating this just to pick up where we left off, Ada and Zillah said this, listen to me. Wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech seventy-seven times. Receiving authority, says Saucy, I'm going to be quoting from his book here. Receiving authority to govern requires taking an oath, which binds the initiate to a code of rights and responsibilities. Interesting, our word oath is cognate with the Hebrew pronounced oath, which is the word translated mark at Genesis 4, 15. The Lord set a mark upon Cain. Was that an oath? And I'm adding that? Think about that. Knowing this, we may accurately say the Lord put Cain under oath, an oath visibly represented by the various insignias governments display even to this day. Now, what's the big deal when American presidents take oaths, the judges take oaths, everybody who gets into this system of evil? And when I say system of evil, that's exactly what it is. Evil rulers need to rule evil people. And without it, there would be even more chaos for people who are not in that evil system and others who just are good people living under it. Just imagine and you have to, in a sense, think about it that way. Uh, so, Cain was put under oath. There's all these insignia now that have been displayed throughout the course of history that still remain the same that we even went over yesterday. Uh, but it is not, when you look at this, going back to Saucy, he says, uh, the Lord put Cain under an oath an oath visibly represented by the various insignia governments display. The mark, then, stands for a covenant between God and Cain. It is not the all-encompassing sort of covenant which God struck with humbly obedient Abraham, though. Is it different? Yes. And I will, and as I will establish my covenant, this is between me and thee, and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. But Cain's unwillingness to obey the letter of uh, God's commandments made him unfit for intimacy with the divine. In Cain's own words, from thy face shall I be hid. The exile covenant was strictly limited to assuring Cain God's vengeance against anyone who would threaten Cain's life. In matters of wisdom, correction, instruction in righteousness, Cain basically was on his own. He was on his own. Also, if he should try to attack the peaceful, the mark was a covenant of retribution only. Now, think about that. Think of today, your leaders. What are they doing today? We know they're creating enemies. 
So let's look at it from the point of view of modern day war on terror. The CIA, the government involved with their Jesuit uh, instructors, go and foment Islamic terrorism. They create it, they start the snowball rolling, they create an enemy because the covenant even with Cain was that it was not to you were not to attack the peaceful so to make sure that they were strictly following this covenant which gave them protection to this day they created the enemies so that when you create the enemy now you're attacking evil correct so early on Cain saw there was great profit in provoking assailants and I submit to you folks they do the same thing today at least that's what many of you think that's all I read about when you go to the internet that's what you see the government inside job on 9-11 the government inside job on Oklahoma City and they're probably correct the government inside job on all of these things and including the war on terror including when you start we've done shows on orchestrations of wars all the way back throughout the course of history way past the American Revolution and showed you that this is a common thread this is nothing new and guess who was doing this long before any American president became president that was the Jesuit order we can date them back to the 1500s when they were formed so that they could create enemies so that they could protect and and bring people together under the Pope now the point I'm trying to make is the more enemies the more spectacular the displays of vengeance says Saucy in his book the more vengeance the more supposed justice the more justice the more power to Cain now if you can just put in any president there put in Putin put in Obama put in put in any president any leader of the whether it be dictator or uh, president of a supposed free republic so the more power to Cain, a more powerful Cain could do more excellent public works. Thus it became essential to the self-interest of the bearer of the mark, which remains to this day a first principle of ordered government, to provoke and encourage evildoing, particularly the form that manifests itself in rebellion. Now, if he understood that back then, don't you think they follow it today? What do you think's in those Vatican archives? What do you think the Jesuit and the Vatican is really all about? Because they are the admit, they are definitely pointed out in Revel Book of Revelations, the Antichrist, and they are the Jesuits. Perhaps, you know, they have two labels. They are the henchmen for the Pope, plus they're the great educators. So, what are they educating you on? What are they doing? What are they telling these leaders of all these countries? Why are they in every country in the world? The question becomes that they provoke and encourage evil doing so that the same thing that Cain saw as profit in provoking assailants because it gave him more power plus the protection under that small, small covenant with God. Now, Cain terrorized evil with an awesome dependability. His faith that God would avenge his enemies made him a highly reliable public protector. Down through the ages, righteous people could live secure in the knowledge that the mark bearer would stop at nothing to persecute evildoers. This fact is marvelously declared in Scripture. In the 7th century, BC, the mark-bearing Babylonians were appointed by God to capture the wayward Israelites and show them some harsh discipline. Israel couldn't understand why God would put a vain, evil Babylonian king over his own chosen people. God explaining, See, he is puffed up, and his desires are not up to upright, but the righteous shall live by his faith. How has the mark managed to remain vibrant, asks Tupper Saucy, for nearly 6,000 years? Grand Commander Albert Pike, 
in his influential morals and dogma threw valuable light on the subject. Now, Albert Pike, for those of you who don't know, go to Washington, and they got a big statue of him. Read his book, Morals and Dogma, and you'll understand more about Freemasonry and what they're really all about. Now, in his book, he declared that from the earliest time, Freemasonry has been the custodian and depository of the symbols, emblems, and allegories erected by who? Enoch. Now, let's just pause for a minute. When I was in Rome in the 80s, there was a huge scandal because when you publicly hear the Vatican talk about Freemasonry, they publicly denounce it. But the real truth of the matter is, is they are actually working with it. And nothing was more evident to that when I first saw the stories appear, I believe in the 1980 in that area, 81, 82, that over 150 high-level bishops cardinals were outed as being members of Masonic lodges, i.e. one major one, P2 back then, which was involved in that huge Vatican Bank scandal. And during canon law, in canon law, if they don't even follow it themselves, but they want to follow, make you think, you know, for example, if you read canon law, it's not murder to commit a heretic, and a heretic is someone who doesn't follow the Pope. But it also states in canon law, which, by the way, is the law of your land, not the Constitution. Uh, and that's the oath that your leaders take, not to uh, represent you, but they take the same oath that Cain took. It's a way to look at it. Now, when you, when you look at uh, what happened here, you had the Vatican publicly stating they denounced Freemasonry, but yet... They're involved in it, and their own canon law says if anyone's caught, they should be excommunicated from the Mother Church. Well, that never happened to these cardinals. In fact, what happened prior, when the Pope, who was kind of like a backstabbing the authority, he was killed after 33 days in office. Then came Pope John Paul II, the Polish cyanide salesman. So, you see the duplicity, the deception. So the Vatican and Freemasonry are the same. They work together. And Pike uh, stated this, Freemasonry has been the custodian and depository of the symbols, emblems, and allegories erected by Enoch. All right. So you're going to say then, wow, he's admitting that it's an evil organization. But he didn't. See, Pike was careful very careful to say he meant not Cain's son Enoch, but the Bible's other Enoch, Enoch II. For simplicity's sake, the good Enoch, the Enoch who was walking with God. But, you know, this is where I found Sasi to be quite interesting, and that rabbi I talked to in 1982 never got into it this way, and I'm glad, and this is one of the main reasons why I appreciated this book. He said, and he did some really nice research be surprised what you can do if you use your head. I don't know if I would have thought of this, but I'm glad he did. Uh, however, Pike's attempt to dissociate his institution from Cain puts the commander at variance, big variance, with Masonic and Biblical chronology. For if the biblical Enoch erected the earliest imagery of Freemasonry. If you look at the chronology, it could not possibly have been Enoch II or the good, the one who walked with God. It had to have been Enoch I. So Sasi says, let's examine the chronology. So bear with me on this because it does get a bit complicated. And like I said, I'm glad he did it. Uh, but he makes a great point. And see how easy it is for Pike to deceive people? That's just one little thing. And how many people on the, on the podiums, you know, the pulpits today in Protestantism, will ever get to this? They don't tell. You know, I've listened to, the, you know, when I go to these Baptist churches or some of these uh, card-carrying Protestant churches who actually are in the ecumenical movement with the Vatican 
their interpretation of Cain and Abel is similar to what I read in the uh, the Catholic interpretation of it that gives no no importance to even the city of Enoch, say, stating that it's not even important to look at it. Well, it sure is. Now, Enoch too. Now, here's what he says. He says, let's look at this chronology to show you that Pike was trying to deceive you when he said that Freemasonry dates back to the good Enoch or the Enoch that followed God just like we do. In fact, if you look at it, Enoch too was descended from Seth. Okay, this is the good Enoch, whom Eve conceived after the death of Abel. For God said she hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. When Eve conceived Seth, Adam was a hundred and thirty years old. He must have been eating really well and didn't have any GMO food, didn't have any of this toxic stuff. Water was good. The air was clean. There wasn't chemtrails. So I don't doubt the person could live that long. We still got a few people, I think like two people in the world that make it to 110 or something. Uh, I don't know how they do it. But according to the scripturally faithful computations of the Archbishop of Armagh, James Usher, 1581 to 1656, Adam was created in 4004 BC. Thus Seth was born in 3874 BC. Genesis 5, 6, 20, for, for, <coughs> 6 verses 6 through 20, gives us an exact toll of the years between Seth and his great, 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 that's four great, grandson Enoch too. Great, 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 great. Four greats. Enoch too. And here's how it goes. According to the Bible, Enoch too was born 400, this is the good Enoch, who Pike said Freemasonry follows was born 492 years after the birth of Seth, or in 3382 B.C. Now, Commander Pike's book, Morals and Dogma, reckons its date of publication in both Christian 1871 A.D. and Masonic 5680 A.M. chronology to find out the beginning of Masonic history, that earliest time in which Enoch erected his symbols, emblems, and allegories in terms of Christian chronology, we subtract the given Christian year from its Masonic equivalent, 1871 from 5680. This gives us, this gives us a first Masonic year of 3809. But the figures show that Enoch II was not born until 3382 some 427 years after Freemasonry's earliest time. Enoch too, then, says Saucy, could not possibly have erected the prototypical symbolic devices of which Freemasonry has ever been custodian and depository. However, Cain's son Enoch I, the one who carried on the mark of Cain, the oath of Cain, was allowed this this very very narrow covenant with God, which also meant you will never be with me. He knew he'd never see God again, and these people understand that too. However, Cain's son Enoch one very well could have been the one that Pike is really talking about. Cain began his wandering after Cain and Abel's death. Now we're going to take a break, finish this up in the second half hour on the investigative journal back in three minutes you're listening to firstamendmentradio.com worldwide freedom is never free we need your support today at firstamendmentradio.com the program you are listening to is 100 percent sponsored by you the listener on this first amendment rights media channel you will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, 
we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Okay, we're back for the second half hour of the Investigative Journal. And remember, you can go to my website at arctic, that's A-R-C-T-I-C-B-E-A-C-O-N dot com. And we're on part five. This will be the last segment of tracing the origins of the New World Order, a.k.a. Old World Order. And we started up in 2015 on Monday with some of the more influential researchers in this area. Moving all the way back to the story of Cain and Abel. And we're at a point now where we're verifying that Freemasonry, which is connected, we might as well call it Vatican Freemasonry, as we just showed you facts, uh, that can't be disputed if you were in Rome in 82. Many Americans didn't even get the story. Uh, That over 150 high-level bishops were actually Freemasons. So don't tell me the Vatican isn't involved with them. They will tell you they denounce it, but it isn't. So Freemasonry now is being proven by the way Albert Pike even stated they are the bearers, the, the holders of all the symbols and signs and emblems of government. And he, we're tracing it not to Enoch too, which Pike was trying to do, the good Enoch, but to the one who follows the mark of Cain, the oath of Cain. The rulers of evil continue to this day. So we're at this point where he says, however, Cain's son Enoch very well could have been what Pike was really talking about. And we discussed the dates which add up to that. Cain began his wandering after Abel's death which the Bible marks with Seth's conception in Adam's age, 130 years, in about uh, 3876 B.C. If we give Cain 10 years to find a wife, settle down, and sire a child, Enoch 1, would have been born in 3866 B.C. This would have make, would make him a 55-year-old man in the first Masonic year, 3809, at the age Enoch 1 would have been fully equipped to erect symbols and allegories memorializing his father's divine appointment to rule populations out of the presence of the Lord. Incidentally, says Saucy, Professor Sace, 
placed Cain in Masonry's early years against his previous determinations. Sace admitted to being compelled by the scholarly diligence of a latter-day Babylonian king to accept the evidence that Sargon lived as early as 4,000 years before Christ. The last king of Babylon uh, had antiquarian tastes and busied himself not only with the restoration of old temples of his country, but also with the disin, uh, disinterment of the memorial cylinders, which their builders and restorers had buried beneath their foundations. It was known that the great temple of the sun god at, uh, uh, was there, had originally been erected by Naram Sin, Enoch, the son of Sargon, and attempts to have been already made to find the records which it was assumed he had entombed under its angles. With true antiquarian seal, this continued the search until he had lighted upon the foundation stone of Naram Sin himself. The foundation stone, he tells us, had been seen by none of his predecessors for 3,200 years, in the opinion, accordingly, of this king, who was curious about the past history of his country, that was N-A-B-O-N-I-D-A-S, and whose royal position gave him the best possible opportunities for learning all that he could about it, Naram Sin, which was Enoch, uh, one and his father Sargon lived 3,200 years before his own time, or 3750 B.C. Now, what we see now, this verifies that all these signs and symbols. Now, you see in your white, in your Capitol building, you see even on the flag of England, and you see all over the place in the in the in the uh, in St. Peter's Square are all the symbols that the Vatican and Freemasonry have kept since following in the footsteps of Cain, Enoch 1. They're following in that oath, not the oath that they are godlike and will see God and will represent God. No, they have been cast aside and they know it. And that's why they're deceiving you. Now what we see in the Bible's accounts according to Saucy of how Enoch the city came about is nothing less than the foundation of the world's legal system, our political system, that God would ordain an evil man to administrate the law, makes sublime sense to me, says Saucy. Now he says, in my final chapter, I'll ask your indulgence in a few personal reflections of my own as to how a system designed to process evil can do such good as well. Because, and I'm ask, adding this, if you look at the world, I mean, you have to look at the good as well as the evil. And there's a lot that's done. And the real point is, why did God protect Enoch? And why did he allow this system to continue? And was it, in my estimation, it was for us to, to understand it so that we could make a final choice. Because once you understand this, then you are making a real choice. And you know how many people, you know the old saying, that uh, when you think about this, wouldn't it be a lot easier to go to work for them? Wouldn't it be a lot easier to have, you know, to just skirt some of the truth and just get in bed with these people? Yeah, there's a lot of money there. You could live a lot better could live a worldly life and maybe that's what the Bible really is talking about and I'd be really curious to see if how many people inside the system right now that works inside this system of evil that are actually doing good work and people outside the system of evil fighting this system if they really understood all this what would be their final decision It'd be an interesting look at how the world could, people would flip-flop, maybe. But the point I'm trying to make is that you have to figure out now. What I tried to do was, if you, if you choose to believe and to say, listen, I only want to go back to 1700 and look at the history there, because uh, 
it's useless to go back 4,000 years. Well, I don't think so, but that's up to you. But I would recommend you do take a little time to read these books that are never written, read by many, many people in America. One, the Bible, and two, Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma. Go to a lot of Manly P. Hall's writing on the occult, Blavatsky. All these people will read. You'll really get a picture of what's going on. Now, when you look at these symbols that represent your country your spiritual life you're gonna see I'm gonna point out a few of them so you understand this and I'm not gonna go back into the old days I'm just gonna talk about if you look at St. Peter's Piazza in Rome you know we've talked about the obelisk which is actually uh, refers to Isis and we have went into that whole idea and I said well why would they use the name Isis if you know they're worshiping Isis in Washington we have the same obelisk we have it in Rome we have it in London we have a number of them all over the world I'm just giving you the three main ones but also in St. Peter's Piazza that I've walked through it hundreds of times I mean I used to go through that square many times and had no idea what the heck it was I asked them once and they told me oh it was a gift from Egypt and you know we like to include everyone in our faith that kind of deal but anyway I finally figured out what it was and uh, it, also in St. Peter's Piazza at Rome, where throngs gathered to give audience to the Pope, it's inlaid with the signature of a new. Remember we talked about that myth that sprung from the Bible? About the signature of a new that the, uh, the, myth, the mythical Cain, Marduk, was given to wipe out the demons of the world? And that symbol is right there inlaid all over. That same symbol that we talked about, the cross, the iron cross, that you'll see on the British flag. Now, the new signature also declares the entrance to Harvard Law School. Now, that's pretty interesting, isn't it? <laughs> uh, we also see it. As uh, Commander Albert Pike attested, the new signature and other emblems representing Cain's authority as as rule have been protected. We see them on all these Masonic temples. You can find them in the uh, the. You'll see the signature of a new. The U.S. Supreme Court building reveals the new signature in its exterior stone and bronze work, as well as its interior throughout. American justice avenge its and its offenders at least sevenfold, not because it is corrupt, but because it has inherited Cain's divine empowerment to do so. Could that be the case? They're showing you the same signature of Anu, of that Marduk war. And so, that's just a few of the symbols. We've talked about many of the other ones that are on top of the Capitol building, how your city was laid out. It had nothing to do with Christianity or democracy. And we've now proven, I think, beyond a reasonable doubt, that what we've just talked about needs to be researched. And it's amazing that you don't see more of this. Why? Why? I, I tell you, I'm not a... I basically just want you to listen to this and to ask yourself a question. Why don't you see more of these connections than you do? For example, like I said, I promised you I uh, before the show I wanted to get a pulse on where people were at. When you say, how do you live with the New World Order? And you would be surprised. They got There's one out there that says, I'll show you how to live with it in 180 days. Now that, to me, give me a break. And then, you know, I went to even, um, John Quaid uh, was an actor who comes out, he talks a lot about rights and privileges. But when he begins talking about it too, he has, um, he starts to attest to the uh, founding fathers and how we have strayed away from the principles of the Constitution. Well, he never gets into really what the founding fathers were all about and how they were in the pocket of Rome. And so you have to be able to go a little bit deeper before you can start talking about rights and privileges. 
And I think once you do that and have that in your in your arsenal of uh, information, which is v far more important than bullets or swords or weapons, you can make a judgment on how to live with the new world order. Now, it's easy for you. I, I love it because people, and I went through a whole bunch of, there's about, God, you can go, there's so many different solutions that make no sense to me because a lot of them show a lack of uh, understanding of history. The idea of how you do that is yours. And I would suggest that before you really make a decision of how you really want to live with this, because I can tell you one thing. One, some people like to go in the forest and live, you know, they want to be these isolationists, the, the you know, what is it, the survivalists, uh, you know, just divorce ourselves from everything and live off the grid and never live, just, just get away, just, that is the wrong way. I don't think that has any bearing on ever getting to the truth. And also, rebellion, to me, is not the right way. So, that's me. Now, if you differ, that's fine with me. But I recommend if you take one of those avenues to research more and to just be patient before you go off, off half-cocked. Because the real idea is for you to make a, a good decision, not just one. And I've made so many bad ones in my life, and I think it's because I didn't quite understand everything. And uh, it's that old saying, stupid is as stupid does, or stupid does as stupid is. Uh, so think about that. Now, also in Saucy's book, he talks about how he how functions in this new world order, or old world order, through his research. Now, his personal story is so different than many of ours that... Uh, it's hard to like put yourself in his shoes just like it's hard for me to put myself in your shoes and for you to walk in mine uh, we walk alone but together and what I mean by that is together we can learn but in the end you're going to be walking alone and making your own decision and where that goes is totally yours and I'm tired of followers. I'm tired of people who wake up and go, I think I'll listen to this today and follow that guy. Or I think I'll listen to this and follow that guy. Or I think I'll do this and follow that guy. Or that whatever. You follow you. And I think you'll be better off. But what he says is don't disregard the Bible. Because he said, Saucy had a great quote, he said, the Bible is such an inviting resource. You know, it's the vigor with which the rulers of evil have suppressed its unlicensed reading. And Saucy says, it's been my experience that as predictably as such these rulers play with truth, the Bible forthrightly tells it. Now, According to God, he says, as given in the scriptures, the purpose of law is to regulate evildoers. And he even quoted Apostle Paul. And uh, you can go to uh, that and re read that in the Bible. Now, what I'm getting at is during this period of time that you've, whatever, whatever your decision, you know, are, are you one that understands that 9-11 was an insight, you know, we live in this old world order, uh, what are you going to do, how are you going to function? But the point I always wondered about was, could there be good people working in this system of condemnation, because that's what it is? And I said, yeah, I, I think there has to be good people. So there has to be people who reconcile, who try to do good works, that are working under this system. And then on the other hand, people who pretend or say they work outside the new world order, the old world order, exposing it, etc. Are there people in that area of what should be reconciliation are there condemners? And I said, yes. And so if you see 
that there's an intersection here in the two groups. Even in, for example, the, the, the idea that God allows this evil to exist through the covenant or the oath of Cain, even to this day, in the system has grown large. Are there people in it that are actually doing good? Yes, there has to be. And that's the same thing when somebody says, you know, hey, uh, you talk against the Vatican, Greg, and you're a Catholic basher. And I, I without even in the thinking of in these terms back then, I would say, no, there are many good Catholics, and I am not talking about them. So that's exactly what I'm talking about. But the point I'm trying to make is if people understood this, these people that are actually reconcilers in, the, in this system of Cain's condemnation, would they... If they understood what we're talking about today, would they stay in it? Or would they expose it and get out? Then you might see the choice. Now, if they stayed in it, I imagine they'd become another condemner. And that's the choice they made. And if they didn't, they'd get out of it and they'd become a reconciler in the system of God that where they could actually see him one day. And same goes for the people that are doing the condemning. How many of these people do you hear about all the time? You know, I mean, it's almost like somebody says, you know, you go up to somebody and you go, I'm a Christian, but I'd love to kill Bush today. Or I want to fight a war against this government. Let's go wipe, throw them all out of the country. I, or, you know, I'm a Christian but let's throw every Jesuit out of here. Now, to me, you're nothing better than a condemner in your own system, which is God's system of reconciliation. Now, those people, if they understood in this stuff that we're talking about, without purposely ignoring it, what decision would they make? And so it goes. But the real point is, when you understand something, you've got to be able to do something with it. So what do you do? And let's say you're living in a system of reconciliation with, as a reconciler, as someone who doesn't want to condemn anybody. I think your only choice is to, as Saucy would say, make yourself available to others so they can hear this. And in a sense, what that means is because the criticism I get when I talk like this, and it always comes back to me, a couple people will say, well, you, you're backing the New World Order now. you got to fight against them. And I say, yeah, no, I'm not. I do not, do not condone what they do. But I can't stop them from doing it. I can't condemn them from doing it because it's not my place to do that. I can tell you what they're doing. I can make, have you make a choice to be with them or not based on the information. And I can do the same with myself. But that's really up to God, the rest of it, isn't it? Isn't that what he says? But how many of us are so impatient want to take God's word and put it in our own hands and do the work that he should is only able to do? That's the problem, I think. And it's not... And listen, I was guilty of it for many years because I didn't understand this information. And am I saying this is the end of the road of information, of understanding? No, this is the beginning of the road to understanding. There's so much more here. That's what keeps you going. And to be honest with you, the last time I'd spoke with uh, Tupper Saucy, he was convinced that was the way it was. And he always said this. He said, go out and find more information. Because I disagreed with him on a few things, and he enjoyed that. But he said, follow what I've You know, if you really think there's a few things in here that you can benefit from, take it farther. Do another book. There's so much more out there that I haven't yet got to. And he was still working on more stuff that he wanted to do before he died in 2000, I believe, in seven. And I wish he would have lived longer because he had a couple of more books on his mind that would have been really great. So, But he did say, get this information out. They'll, you'll never know. There might be somebody else that listens to you that will do something great in this field 
that takes it one step farther, that has an idea that you don't think about, because we're not God. And it's the impatience of people that put try to say, listen, I am, and I'm going to do the, only the work he can do. And I think that's a mistake. That's just me. But anyway, I've enjoyed uh, this this week bringing this stuff to you, and I, I my hope would be that some of somebody out there can put them all together, put them on a YouTube or something, so that people could see it as far and wide as we can, because that's how we get listeners here. Uh, ABC News is not going to, or CNN, or the History Channel, or anybody's not going to take and make a series like this. They don't want you to know these things. This is the key to, I think, opening the beginning door of finding some things that we haven't yet found in this world. And it is amazing what you can find if you really open up your mind here and look at some of the books that I mentioned here today, including the Bible. Uh, and I say that to people out there who get turned off when they hear that word. Uh, for you that do, just read it for historical purposes, and you may find out that it has much, much more than just that. Well, we're all out of time on this Friday. Have a good weekend. We will see you Monday on the Investigative Journal here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Good night. Have a good evening.